Stan. Welcome to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here. And I have a new company now. So Tiger Shark Energy Consulting Hawaii H2 is my new company. So I'll send business cards to all of you. Just send me a note. Anyway, today's show is a really special one. We've, uh, we've had Mike Stritsky on the show before, and he's talked about his hydrogen house. But uh, a lot's been going on in, in the world of hydrogen. And um, one of the things that I found really interesting was um, the last time we did this show with Mike, he was um, calling in from California during all the wildfires. And sure enough, we got another spate of wildfires in California now. And it just so happens that uh, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, was actually the cause of several of the major wildfires in California. So this year they decided to shut off power um, when conditions were especially too windy to keep their lines from arcing and starting more wildfires. And what that did was it caused a whole bunch of folks in California to go without power. And when I say a whole bunch of folks, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of people are without power. And uh, Mike has a, a hydrogen house uh, plan or a startup in California. And the folks in California have contacted him a little bit about, you know, what they can do to exit the grid and, and be totally off the grid using hydrogen. So, so Mike, welcome to the show. And, and if you could just kind of give the folks a, a brief, re, brief recap of uh, how you got started with Hydrogen House. And, uh, and we'll get into talking about your uh, off the grid system. Yeah, I've been doing hydrogen for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, when I worked for the Department of Transportation, I built two hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, you know, this was before anybody even knew what they were, and they were just fresh out of NASA. Um, two companies went public, Millennium Cell and H-Power, which later now is plug power. So I um, have a lot of history in the fuel cell industry. I knew this was the solution 30 years ago. Um, and that's why I've pursued it ever since. Uh, the, the Hydrogen House project was started in 2006, and we've been off-grid now for 16 years. So cooking gas, heating gas, fuel for the vehicle is all done from solar hydrogen that we make three months of the year. So there's no shelf life with hydrogen. It's made from water and sunlight. 80% of all matter in the universe is hydrogen. So, you know, right now the world's waking up that batteries are not going to make it. So there isn't enough lithium in the world, uh, you know, to supply less than 1% of the cars. And lithium are now going to fuel cells. So uh, the world's becoming a very different place very quickly. And as we can see climate change for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we're seeing the reactions all over the world. Exactly. So did you ever get the California Hydrogen House up and running, or was the fire last time uh, a game changer that you have to recover from yet? Um, well, we, we had lost the, uh, there was damage to the buildings there, but, uh, um, you know, we're still in the midst of putting uh, the Hydrogen House Malibu together. We did have a uh, container home that we had run on solar hydrogen that survived the fire. So all of the, this was in a mobile trailer park. Everything in the whole park burned. There was nothing left except for the hydrogen uh, uh, jewel box and the, uh, and the container home. So that's a tribute to it. Um, there were a lot of marais that were purchased and running around Malibu last year, and uh, there were no incidences with those when these cars completely burned up. Hydrogen vented, and that was the end of it. No explosions, no... No, nothing more than, uh, in fact, a lot less than having a gasoline car. So that's just a testament to the safety of these vehicles. That's outstanding, because <laughs> I know that the, the movie you sent me in, can, can we say the name of the movie? That's not classified or anything, right? Uh, yeah, it's called, yeah, yeah, it's At War with the Dinosaurs, and uh, the, the movie will release to the public within the next two months. Yeah, that was, I got so, to uh, see a trailer and uh, watch the whole movie in advance, thanks to Mike, and it's an outstanding film. And, and I, uh, I really like your, your quote in there that, um, that, that you basically said at the end, that it was, you're the only person that said, it's even on the trailer, about, um, about hydrogen um, being free, and that's part of the problem. Just like when Tesla and um, Thomas Edison were working on electricity, Tesla's view of electricity was everybody should have it for free. 
and that became problematic. Right. We just buy and sell equipment. Yeah, and that became problematic for his technology because the big the big boys wanted to make money and they wanted to control stuff, so they wanted to have something that they controlled all the aspects of. And Tesla philosophically was looking for free energy for, for the masses. I think that's part of one of the problems with hydrogen. It's like it's free, like you said at the start. It's it's uh, the most common element in the universe, and we can get it from water. We can get it from methane. We can get it from all kind of places. And you know, it that's actually probably one of the reasons why it didn't take off. And that movie, that war with the dinosaurs, talked a lot about that and some of the other stumbling blocks that have kept hydrogen from taking its rightful place. But the real good well, news. The problem is, is the hydrogen is the cure for the disease, not the treatment. You know, so that's you know, right. the cancer company like Amgen, basically, you don't want to cure cancer. You don't want to cure diabetes. You don't want to cure anything. You want to treat it forever. And you want to be tied to people's pharmaceutical umbilical cord through your insurance till the day you die. And then they bury their <laughs> mistakes. You know, so yep. this is, you know, no, I think you broke They don't want to cure anything. You, and I and if we don't cure this, there won't be any place to spend the money. You've broken the code on no all future. that stuff. You're exactly right. And it's kind of the it's kind of the greedy side of capitalism. And and I'm a I'm a big capitalist supporter and small business supporter, but you know, when people get greedy and you know and forget the big the big picture, which is a better humanity and better society, um, they they lose sight of that fact and we're all in big trouble. Because like you say, um, we've been fighting cancer for probably 50 years or more, and I know we're making we headway. In, disease since polio. Yeah, so it's it's pretty tough to to break up those big monopolies, and I think that's one of the things that uh, our government needs to start doing is is taking apart some of these big monopolies, including some of the um, the uh, technology companies like Amazon's uh, or Facebook, Twitter, um, Google. So if we drop dead here, it's because they're they're catching the bad mouth that I'm giving them, but uh, you know they, those big companies control so much that uh, we need to we need to get some security. And our country's built on personal freedom and personal accountability, and we're we're, we're kind of losing that personal control. So um, anyway, we get a little far off the subject. Yeah, we, we've yeah we've stopped becoming the entrepreneurs that we used to be. I mean, basically, if we fail to keep evolving, we're going to end up extinct like the dinosaurs were born out of the ground. You know, we, we have to evolve or we're going to end up like Blockbuster or, or Kodak. Yep. You know? yep. They created the technology, refused to adopt it, and look what happened. Yep. As a species, we have to evolve with the technology. It's the only thing that creates wealth. Yep. So we've got to do the right thing, not the political thing. Yep. And if we if you don't do it for any other reason, do it for your kids and your grandkids. Exactly. You know, leave a legacy behind, not just the balance sheet. Well, I know you also uh, picked up recently um, a used Toyota Mirai, and um, you were telling me about um, those actually starting to show up on the East Coast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that for the audience? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these Toyota Mirais are coming off lease now, so they've got about 30,000 miles on them. Um, I purchased one that was non-Toyota uh, certifiable, which means that it had more damage on more than two body panels. Um, but that car I picked up for $12,000. Shipped it out here and we're converting it to a generator. So, you know, these cars are available out on the market now. So, the nice thing about it is, is Toyota's decided to extend um, their research program, call it, with the Mirai, where they're going to give people another three years of free warranty and another $15,000 of free fuel if you pick up a Toyota certified vehicle. So a friend of mine just bought a vehicle in Malibu. He paid $17,000 with $15,000 worth of free fuel wow. and three year bumper to bumper. So how the heck are you gonna beat that deal? Yeah, that's tough to beat. That's really awesome. And you know, I just saw on the, on the internet today that um, they had the highlights from the to from the Tokyo Auto Show, and I looked through all the electric vehicles, and I didn't see any fuel cells. But the the Toyota Mirai was actually listed as one of the the top um, picks in the of all the vehicles. I mean, electric and hybrid and internal combustion. It was like right up there, and and they they said it's a run by a hydrogen fuel cell. 
The Toyota Mirai has 114 kilowatt fuel cells, is that correct? Uh, and it makes uh, 12 gallons of drinking water every tank full. Wow. So if you get thirsty along the ride, you, you drink the same thing the astronauts do. They call it God water. Yeah, because it collects the it. hydrogen and the oxygen. It collects right? it, right? It collects it and you can actually dispense it. It collects about it. a half a gallon. Yeah. But um, could capture all of it. That'd be great. So, you know, you've got, you've got um, your Mirai, and you say you're going to adapt it so you can plug your house into the Mirai and run your house off the Mirai. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, right now with all these uh, <clears throat> crises going on, you know, we have a lot of energy in these battery-powered fuel cell hybrid vehicles that we can't utilize. I mean, the most you can get is a small car inverter for your 12-volt outlet. You know, we want to be able to utilize the whole power of the vehicle. I mean, if you think about it, these generators, you know, even on a hybrid vehicle are 4% efficient on a, on a regular, you know, one that powers your house because they have to maintain RPM. With a solid state uh, system, you basically only consume the amount of fuel for what you're using. You know, so your efficiency you know, quadruples. Uh, you know, in addition to that, you have a backup to the backup. You know, these engines are allowed, you know, run long periods of time. These generators don't last very long. And especially now, where California is shutting the power off for three days to three weeks at a time, you know, people are really screwed. It's one thing to do without power for a couple hours, but when you start to go into the couple of day mode, you know, and then you're, you know, you're, you can't get out to get fuel, you're really in trouble. So, and, you know, these things are going to get worse. Like I said, you know, last last year we had the terrible fires, you know, in Malibu and the campfire up north, and these things are devastating. The utilities are, you know, they shut down the, the power this time to over a million customers and over a million people were evacuated. So you're looking at, you know, these are large numbers, and this is going to, they said this is going to become uh, a yearly event because, you know, the, the, Half of the fire takes a different route every time, depending on the way the Santa Ana winds are blowing. So you didn't get it last year, but you may get it the next. Right. And then that grows back up again, and you get it again. So, you know, the aging you, you, a grid in these remote places, you know, is going to continue to fail because they put their money in their pocket and not into the, into the infrastructure. And now the chickens are coming home to roost. Mm -hmm. You know, they replaced all these telephone poles in Malibu with what, steel poles? No, that makes too much sense. Let's, let's put the, you know, uh, creosote poles back in. Yeah. You know, if they don't do, you know, so, so basically you're putting in matchsticks, you know, in a fire. Yeah. Well, it's cheaper. So that's why they're doing yeah. it. Yeah, we found out how cheaper works out, huh? Yeah. In fact, uh, we, we like to use the term fully burdened cost when you're trying to do real analysis because cheaper doesn't work <laughs> in the fully burdened cost model. Well, we have to go back to doing things, right? We have to go back to building things ourselves. We just have to have pride in our work, and we have to do. We have to have quality again, and demand quality. You know, we, we've got to get out of the throwaway world where we, we build things rather than throw them in the landfill. Yeah, you know, it's really yeah. funny. I, I remember uh, seeing a documentary one time, and they talked about the term "close enough for government work," and at one time that actually meant very, very high standards. It was, it was like. If you were going to do government work, you had to meet the highest standards in the industry or the government wouldn't accept it. Now we look at it as if it's just close enough for government work, it's probably the minimum standard. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of um, manufacturers and companies have adopted is it's, it's good enough, minimum, we'll wear dated, it's only good for a couple of years, it wears out, we'll replace it, we'll throw it away, get a new one. And that's, that's really not a very good model. You're right, we have to go back to the, to the old ways. Hey, what, Mike, we're going to take a well, quick break here for 60 seconds, and we'll be right back, and uh, we'll talk some more okay. about, especially about the California fires, and maybe some more about your, uh, your hydrogen house concept. Okay. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey every Wednesday at 11 a.m., Think Tech Hawaii. Please join us. Aloha. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanneman. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101. 
where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past, we need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here with Mike Stritsky all the way from, uh, it's almost his bedtime now, all the way from New Jersey. And um, we're talking a little bit about the wildfires in California, but I, I want to get back to um, two things. Number one is uh, his, his Toyota Mirai that he just bought used for like 12,000 bucks, if I got the price right. Um, you know, if you went to buy a brand new 100 kilowatt fuel cell, which is the same size or actually a little smaller than what's in the Mirai, how much would that cost, Mike? About $600,000 so if you, you're buying a Ballard fuel cell. So you bought a car used for under $15,000. And in it is a 114 kilowatt fuel cell with probably 15 or 20 years more use out of it. And you paid 12,000 bucks for it and yep. to buy one Cheapest commercial. Fuel cell on the market. Yeah, to buy a commercial one from a, a professional company, it, just the fuel cell alone would cost 600, oh, half a million, over half a million dollars. So that, right, and that's not counting the tanks and everything else yeah. that are in the car. So, so the, the state would, you know, people used to ask me, Dan, where's your business case for hydrogen? And I'd said, Toyota. Toyota's my business case for hydrogen because they've already taken most of the platinum out of the fuel cell, which was a big cost piece. They've made it uh, more efficient. They've made it lighter. They've made it smaller. Um, they've done everything over 20 years to get the fuel cell as perfect as they could get it. And now they're they made it mass producible. And what they did that no one else has done is they're willing to sell these things order to ca capture a market. Yep. So basically, if you're a company like Ballard, if you're trying to make the maximum amount of money and all of your R&D on a very limited number of, of units. Toyota says, look, we're going to sell them like we're selling in mass production, and that's what they did with the Toyota Prius. And they, they become the largest automaker in the world. So Toyota truly is betting the farm on this technology, which is why they've released 5,500 patents Free to the world is open source. So, you know, they're all in. You know, they're making, they're turning sewage into fuel for these vehicles in Japan. Yep. You know, so they're putting their money where their mouth is, you know, in order to, to capture this economically, and we're sitting on our hands. You know, the U.S. automakers aren't doing anything with fuel cells. Now, the, the U.S. You is, know, they're wait and see. The U.S. has lost their edge in this industry to virtually everybody, including China. And um, if I understood right, the 2020 Olympics, Summer Olympics in Japan are going to be pretty much run on hydrogen. And I just That's hope that... pretty much it, yeah. I, I hope that gets the attention of uh, the folks in this country. And they realize that hydrogen is what's going to get us to that clean energy future and that carbon-free future. And we need to take it seriously. Well, I think the problem is, is there's just too many <laughs> entrenched interests that are in the U.S., you know, that are making money off the status quo. You know, they don't want to change anything, you know, because they're making money on it. The problem is, is there, like I said, there isn't going to be a planet to spend it on. You know, there's going to be no future for our grandchildren, and, you know, we're destroying this planet. What happens when you destroy your home? Yeah. You know, they're, they're finding that out in California with all these homes that they're losing. Well, all I these think... people have nowhere to go. I think you broke the code, though, because, you know, like you say, the, who was selling fuel cells before Toyota put them in cars and put them out there? All the companies that sell fuel cells and hydrogen uh, electrolyzers and stuff, they were, they were following that model that you said where, hey, they've got to make all their money back, all their R&D, all Absolutely. their capital costs up front. So the, the equipment's been way too expensive. But now you got Toyota that's, you know, said, we're going to take a loss for a couple of years. And, Eventually, we're, we're going to own the market, and sure enough, they are. And Toyota, they, Toyota owns every piece of that car. They own the technology, the tanks, they own the fuel cell, they own all the electronics, they own all the software, 
And by uh, by basically owning this, they're not paying markup from any of these other companies that that you know normal industry has. I do. Yeah. You know? Exactly. So if you own everything, you know you can control the uh, you know what gets spent on the vehicle. You're not paying you know 100x on these things. I mean, a perfect example are these hoses for the cars. You're looking at seven thousand dollars for a hose. All right. There's no competition, and there's you know literally only two companies in the world that make them. Yeah. So yeah. we've got to get out of that mode, and you know we can't make the regulations so overburdening for no reason just to, to try, you know protect the gas companies. Yeah. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. We've got to make it simple, stupid. Yeah. You know. Let's talk a little but, bit about, about the Hydrogen House project itself. Um, I know that we've highlighted on some previous programs, but for the audience today, just give a quick rundown on how much PV and uh, how you store your hydrogen and, and what's the cycle, you know? You charge batteries yeah, and then so, make hydrogen or what? Yeah, so what I do is, is fairly simple here. I've been doing this now for 16 years. I've perfected the system here. Uh, to a point where, you know, I travel a lot and everything runs by itself. It needs very little maintenance. So, first of all, we start with 27 kilowatts of solar, and that provides all my cooking gas, heating gas, fuel for the vehicle, all my energy needs. So, during the springtime, when I have long solar days, and uh, I should say longer than normal anyway, they're getting longer, and uh, I have uh, basically... Uh, no heat or air conditioning load. So that 27 kilowatts goes through my electrolyzer and it fills 12 1,000 gallon propane tanks full of hydrogen to 200 pounds, which is about 90 kilograms or 90 gallons of gasoline. Um, so once that's done, I'm done for the year. I shut the electrolyzer off. And all during the summer months, so from the end of June to the uh, last week in September, I'm back feeding the grid and I'm making a, making money. Um, during the fall, I'm neutral till about December. So from the you know, last week in September to about the first week in December, I have enough just between solar and batteries to be just fine. I have enough energy for all my loads. During the winter months, December, January, February, March, and part of April, I don't have enough energy. So the fuel cell runs at night anywhere from four to six hours to run my geothermal, which is my largest load in the hydrogen house. So that's about 78 kilowatt hours or 75 kilowatt hours a day I use uh, for heat and air conditioning where I use uh, less than five in the summertime and I have the most amount of energy. So essentially my system bottles sun, sunlight and I can use it wherever I want, weeks, months, years from now. The, uh, I use the hydrogen during the winter, and then we go back to the spring, and the whole cycle starts all over again. So as long as a big nuclear ball in the sky shows up for work, I've got all the energy I need. Um, and this system is reproducible. We went public with a company called HCL Energy back in 2015 doing hydrogen homes for people. And that's what we're doing today. Right now, the need is getting greater than ever, and the cost of the equipment is getting to be less than half of what it was five years ago. So, you know, as increases in technology happen, as uh, mass production happens, and, you know, the codes are adopting all of the, um, the, the new fuel, so the, the hydrogen, we're now seeing that this is going to become an industry, and we're looking at this worldwide, not just, you know, America. There are 270,000 hydrogen homes powered off natural gas in Japan. I think I built the only five in the U.S. Wow. So we're, we're really behind the stick here. Yeah. Well, so... You know, so Texas, with all this excess wind and solar, needs to be going out of the fossil fuel business and going into the renewable business. Their shareholders don't give a crap where their revenue comes from as long as it shows up. Yeah, and I want to you know, point out to the audience too something about your house. And you talked about your your um, HVAC system, your heating and cooling system, and and how much it, how much energy it used. But I want to point out to folks that your heating and cooling system is actually um, more like a heat pump. You you've got um, you've got a heat exchange system buried underground, 
And that same temperature of, um, it's maintained around, around 70 degrees or so, is your air conditioning in the summertime and your heating in the wintertime when it's really cold because underground, the temperature maintains a constant and you just, you have a, an exchanger down there that, that pumps uh, 70 degree air into your house wintertime for heating and summertime for cooling as part of your efficiency in your house. Is that correct? Yeah, so the, the geothermal system has a mile of thick wall copper tube uh, buried underground eight feet. So I extract the 56 degree ground temperature, which is virtually the same almost uh, nationwide. And, uh, you know, during the summertime, I'm only moving the, the cold from the ground to the house. So I'm not making anything up. I'm taking 56 degrees and making the house 70. That's why it uses no energy in, for the air conditioning cycle. During the heating cycle, I've got to make up a 12 degree differential. Ah, okay. So I'm bringing 56 degrees in and the heat pump does what heat pumps does. It makes the, the cold colder and the hot hotter and that's what heats the house. But I have used more electricity because I have to make up that differential in the winter. Yeah, that explains, that explains far the, more the difference. Yeah, okay. it's, it's far more efficient than you know, your traditional heating system because you're extracting the energy from the ground. Right. So, you know, geothermal is used all over the country, you know, heat pumps, pump and dump wells, all kinds of things, you know, to extract ground temperature to offset heat and air conditioning loads, which are the largest loads of almost any, uh, you know, home around the world. Uh, I tell so, you what, that, that's really a great model, Mike. And, you know, I know you only got a handful of houses out there to date, but I'm, I'm hoping uh, for your company and for you that uh, people start to wise up and start following the model and you get out there and, and build a bunch of houses uh, that, that use your model. Well, what has to happen, Stan, is pretty simple. We have to start voting with our checkbooks. If you want to see change, you've got to vote for change. And the only vote that really matters is the one where you're spending your dollar because there will be no force in industry will stop the, the trend where people are buying things. Okay? So if you want a change, you can't sit there and talk about it. You've got to sit there and you've got to buy it. You know, you got to vote for solar and wind and LEDs and energy efficiency and less waste. You know, you got to you got to vote for what you want, and you got to vote with your checkbook. That's good advice, Mike, yeah. and and I, I think that really kind of sums it all up. Uh, you know, we're we're faced with choices every day, and the choice for clean energy is uh, not necessarily the cheapest. But if it's if it's the future you're worried about, you know, you need to step up and make the choice yourself. And uh, I'm telling you, though, the price of solar is going down. Uh, the price of the vehicles is dropping. The quality is still there and then getting better. Uh, so the choice is getting easier and easier to make. So, you know, believe it or not, we... Yeah, we, we, I mean, the only reason that we have battery electrics right now is because they're going to give oil another 10 years. Yeah. It's a known failure. Yeah. No yeah. matter how many times I run the math, there's just no way that... You know, there's enough lithium on the planet that we're going to build the grid nine times bigger, and we're still powering off of coal. Yeah. We got batteries that that end up in the environment that you drink. Yep. You know, they're non-recyclable, and these things catch fire. Yep. And, you know, all of these grid storage plants, the ones in Hawaii, you probably know better than anybody, yep. you know, have caught fire, yep. and the companies have gone out of business. They just had a fatal fire recently, but remember, fully burden cost. That's if I can drive that one home, you got to think about what everything costs, where it's mined, what it costs to manufacture it in terms of environmental impacts, end of life disposal, everything. Well, Mike, believe it or not, yep, we've, we've blasted, well. we blasted through 30 minutes already, and uh, I know it's almost your bedtime, <laughs> so I'm going to let you go. And I want to thank you for sharing information with me and uh, sharing the movie with me because uh, I'm looking forward for it to come out because it... It was a, a well done documentary and I'm looking forward to it. We'll see if we can get it to the Maui Film Festival in uh, this summer coming up in 2020. But have a great evening. Okay, I, um, yeah, yeah I ahead. sent you another AOL video we did last week. I think you'll find it interesting. If you want to post it up on your website, feel free. Okay, thanks a lot, Mike. Until next week. All right, week, have a good one, Stan. Thanks, aloha, Mike. Yep. Until next week, uh, Stan Energy Man signing off, aloha. Oh.